So an article in The Guardian yesterday endorsed criminalising Islamophobia and used former Prime Minister Boris Johnson as the er case as to who should go to prison. Let's read the article, its related report, and point out the preposterousness of this proposal, while, of course, not criticising Islam ourselves, because I don't want to do jail time, because unfortunately this has been backed by the Labour Party and its front bench. Of course it has. Yeah. Speaking of why free speech is uh, curtailed for the public good, if you subscribe to our website and pay for us £5 a month, it's really worth it, it's better than Netflix, you can go and watch Carl and Callum chat about John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, which the current neoliberal paradigm like to deflect to and say it's a really useful defence of free speech. However, it only defends it in terms of being of utility to grand scale problem solving rather than being an inalienable, inextricable right to your person to speak and then having moral constituencies small satellite libertarian communities or however you want to describe it exactly say that well we don't particularly you don't line up with our ideals so off you pop and find somewhere else instead it's saying that the state in theory could constrict your speech if you are impeding the long arc of history bending towards justice and that's the exact same idea that's behind this nutcase's yeah. academics well, you, plan you, you could say that his other, his big defense that i'm mostly familiar with was that if you don't have the conversation that you might be uh, potentially denying yourself some kind of knowledge or opportunity to strengthen your own knowledge, yada, yada, yada. The problem is that if the people within the state uh, in control of the levers of power decide that there is nothing knowledgeable or useful to be gained of this situation or conversation, then they can just have free reign to go like, well, it doesn't count as free speech. You see it all the time, yep. especially among leftists and Islamists saying that free speech is only free if it doesn't offend anybody. Exactly. If you're not engaged in the project of collective problem solving, then you don't get to talk. And that seems to be what this woman is talking about. If we can go on to her profile in academia. John, this is an Oxford academic called Dr. Soraya Bai. If we just take a cursory scroll down of some of the things she's written before. So the most recent paper is the Index of Islamophobia, which we'll be reading through shortly. But it's other papers, if you just keep scrolling slowly, Cycle of Decolonization, uh, Panopticon's Power and Pleasure, why the hijab is not a problem. There's one where she says that COVID-19 positive tests should become a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. I trust this person to respect Western values. Exactly my point. So let's go on to the article, shall we? We've given ourselves a little bit of background. So yesterday she published this. Islamophobia from the likes of Boris Johnson must be punished and this is how to do it. So we're going to take a cursory read. A House of Commons report confirms Islamophobia as the most common form of religious hate crime in the UK. Specifically, 42% of all religious hate crimes reported to the police were attacks against Muslims. Now, Note the word attacks here, because hate crime is an umbrella term, meaning you have taken offence on reported offensive speech, or you have perceived someone decided to beat you up because you are perceived to be a Muslim, because the definition of the UK is Muslimness or perceived Muslimness, and that is what someone takes action on if they're Islamophobic. So if they see you as a Muslim, and they're hateful towards you, and you can say, they were hateful towards me because they were racist, because they saw that I'm brown and they saw me as a Muslim. That means it's an Islamic phobic hate crime, even if they just called you a silly name completely unrelated to it. So, so if, I, if, if I'm on the lash, out with the boys, yeah. and me and Raj, me and the old pal, get into a little bit of a scrap because we're both a bit drunk and rowdy, yes. if he felt like it, he could, even though he wouldn't be like Muslim or anything, he could just hypothetically call the police and say he's being Islamophobic against me and get me arrested. Yeah, if you, for example, went out with your Indian friend, or you went out with someone you didn't know, right? And he was eating a kebab too quickly and you said, stop being a pig. He could report you as Islamophobic. <laughs> Brilliant. That Wonderful. is the state of modern Britain. So she says, but a genuine effort to punish Islamophobia and Islamophobic attacks are so weak that statistics on prosecutions and convictions are entirely absent. We know, nothing, uh, we know nothing about how the police deal with complaints of Islamophobia or whether there is a uniform process across all forces. Meanwhile, Islamophobia goes unpunished and grows. This must change. This entire article is a call to action. Now, of course, when we're talking about policing speech, there's the issue of it is impossible to provide an objective definition of offence, as our ridiculous examples just gave. So how do you think she decides to work her way around the fact that you can't create an objective definition? Um, the definition is her personal definition, and that's the one that should apply to all cases because she says so. No, she just says we don't need a definition at all. Oh, words don't need meanings? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. I've never heard that argument before. The debate about how to punish it has been bogged down by the task of finding a definition. That's, this may be important, but British Muslims cannot wait while scholars debate how to define what has long been an obvious and cruel daily reality. What, what obvious and cruel daily reality? If I remember correctly, British Muslims choose to self-segregate in 
in their little enclaves. And I think it's only only about 30% of British Muslims, and which is an oxymoronic term in the first place, um, actually interact with anybody outside of the ethnic enclaves. Most of them either spend their time flitting between here and Pakistan, or they just spend all of their time in their little communities. Yeah, and so, unfortunately, if you do not integrate to Britain, the community tensions will continue to rise. And this creates a perpetual justification for saying society is intolerant of us because we don't want to integrate and instead we want to have preferential treatment. Well, I mean, even if they didn't integrate, I mean, one thing that would help all tensions and situations would be to stop grooming. That could land us in prison under this new law, unfortunately, Harry. So enjoy your time in Belmarsh, mate. All right, well, I'll take this. I'll take the rap for it. There you go. <laughs> Community-based definitions of Islamophobia based on harsh experience are ignored by a legal landscape that approaches prosecution and conviction through outdated methods and systems. What, like asking for proof? Right, okay. So we should have Sharia courts. Brilliant. But, I mean, are we surprised that that's what she's asking for? No. So now that we've set in stone that the kafar must be punished... What's the solution, she says. How do we properly punish Islamophobes? It's a direct quote. As a lecturer in cultural geography at Oxford University, I've used my research skills to draw up an index of Islamophobia to help police, prosecutors, victims and analysts work out when to take legal action and how to map out the routes towards such action. Importantly, this is the first time an index to measure a hate crime has been proposed. So she's got a mathematical hate crime calculation index, which we'll be looking at very shortly. Published last week, this index of Islamophobia is accompanied by Pathways to Prosecution form, which helps identify the laws breached and scores each hate crime on the basis of intensity, intention, impact, and recklessness. Those are actually the four metrics that she uses. So, intensity, so perceived hurt feelings. Intention, perceived intent. Impact, more perceived hurt feelings. And recklessness, more perceived intent. So she's going to read the tea leaves as to whether or not you intended to destroy your entire religion and decide how upset she was and therefore how much time you should spend behind bars. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just seeing some of the examples that she's giving in the oh, next paragraph. Let's go over them, they're hilarious. So she says, how might it work? Let's look at some of the flagrant examples of Islamophobia, including Boris Johnson's infamous comments on burqa-wearing Muslim women as letterboxes. He also said bank robbers, don't discredit him. The distribution of violence-inducing Punish a Muslim Day letters, a headscarf being torn from a Muslim woman, and being called Shemima Begum in the workplace. Now, that last one, we're not going to go too much into detail was with, but the Poplar and Linehouse MP decided to say that happened to her in a parliamentary hearing on Islamophobia. So we have her word for it. If that happened, then I'm sure it was a, a reprehensible, ignorant comment and you shouldn't compare a member of parliament to an actual ISIS terrorist because that's pretty unfair. Uh, the other examples we will go through, though. Well, I mean, I'm sure that there's missing context in this paragraph here, but it's interesting that she's put her feely speech alongside incitement, actual incitement to violence and actual assault. Because yeah. we already have laws against those that don't need to be along racial lines. You can just say incitement to violent, don't do that. Assault, also don't do that. Simple as. Well, we'll go through these examples to see how legitimate they are, shall we? The first one, of course, the thing she wants to imprison Boris Johnson over. And bear in mind, I'm no fan of Boris Johnson after he put me in house arrest for two years. But this is ridiculous. If we go over to the next link, please, John. This was what he actually wrote. Denmark has got it wrong. Yes, the burqa is oppressive and ridiculous, but there's still no reason to ban it. Right. So when he was making jokes about how Muslim women wearing the burqa, which is the isolate only one, by the way, look like ninjas, bank robbers, letterboxes, all very Islamophobic content, which we cannot condone here, of course, I assume it's because he was trying to poke fun at you in the same way you would poke fun at a friend in order to help you integrate into British society. And he's actually defending your right to wear it. Now, I... Don't think it's a very healthy society which mandates women walk around with their face covered at all times. But Boris Johnson taking the very moderate, very liberal position here, and she's saying because he made a few mean jokes in his defence of allowing me to wear this tool of oppression throughout the Muslim world, then he should spend time in prison. I mean, I do find it funny. They always really, really hate Boris Johnson for this, even though that Boris Johnson and the rest of the Conservative parties act as nothing but just an ushering in of leftist policies anyway. So even if you're complaining Boris Johnson said some mean jokes to you, he's still more than happy to go ahead, as this article proves, with everything else you want. He just wants to do it in a bit of a friendly way, yep. which you don't. And so this wouldn't t these sorts of laws, they wouldn't touch Boris Johnson. They wouldn't touch people who are in positions of power. They would hit 
the person on the street. The average English... Uh, bleh, the average Englishman mm. who isn't particularly happy with how his culture is changing, with how his neighborhood is changing, with how the jobs are changing, with the increasing prices of houses, um, but it would punish them for speaking out about it. Because as we've, as we've established, there is no objective metric for whatever Islamophobia is. So even complaining, why have I lost my job to a bunch of foreigners, could be construed as Islamophobic in this situation. Yes, if you perceive those foreigners to be Muslim. And... For example, it's complete anarcho tyranny. It's yeah, if you ridiculous. critique Albanian drug dealers, for example, well, they could perceive that as being Islamophobic. So, why are the Albanians selling my teenage son cocaine? Sorry, mate, off to the jail with you. Exactly, you shouldn't have spoken out against the Quran. Get out of the, the London Tower again. The next example. So this was actually linked to. Go back, please, John. This article from the Guardian was actually linked to in her article. So you can. What is quite useful to do sometimes is just click the links that these articles actually link to and you can go down the rabbit hole. So it says, Communities across the UK have been responding to violent threats contained in a letter promising that 3rd of April would be Punish a Muslim Day. So this was her second example. The phrase was coined in an anonymous letter distributed to some homes and businesses last month with recipients in East London, the Midlands and Yorkshire. The letter suggested people could win points for a range of activities aimed at Muslims, including removing a headscarf from a woman or beating a person up. Muslim MPs were also sent the letter, as was Sajid Javid, who isn't a Muslim, but was Home Secretary at the time. Now, it goes without saying, don't call for violence if you don't want to end up in prison in Britain. As you already said, just simple. Doesn't matter if you have grievances with whatever group, just don't say beat people up and you won't spend time in prison. This prompted hashtag love a Muslim events to be set up in Nottingham, Bradford, Wakefield, Sheffield, Leeds, and a stand up to racism event in Edinburgh. So you can see the non-profit mobilized grievance mongering organizations come out with their counter narrative and they can solicit more and more donations because quite conveniently there's uh, an endless supply of prejudice to fight back against and you should never trust an activist to solve a problem because it's far too profitable i always forget to what's, what's, the, what's the whole thing with non-profits not being uh, like why do they call them non-profits because the people in charge of them always seem to be rich quite wealthy it's like when joe biden set up a cancer charity and spent over 90 percent of it on salaries the hashtag hashtag punish a muslim day began trending on twitter in the early U in the uk early on tuesday the vast majority of the tweets condemned the idea right so wasn't widespread Islamophobia then. Most of the tweets were about, why is this trending? Oh my God, that's horrible. Okay. However, some accounts using the logos of far-right organizations suggested the letter had been a false flag operation. Oh wait. So the far-right organizations, far-right, don't know whether or not they were. Also, I don't agree that fascism is far-right. See our book clubs on doctrine of fascism to explain why it's a leftist collectivist ideology. Even they were saying, this seems a bit sus to me, mate, because we didn't put this out. So this seems to be almost entirely astroturfed by one crazy person. Well, and what what are all those hate crimes against black people in America being revealed as, oh, they're being false flags by angry black students? We'll get onto that later. Oh. There were also some instances of fake claims about the day being spread on social media, with one tweet suggesting that 10 Muslims had already been killed today in the name of Punisher Muslim Day, shared more than 100 times, and other tweets claiming attacks had already begun. So there's no violence that happened because of this campaign. Again, silly to call for violence, but no violence actually happened. If we look at the next one, as you said, the guy who did this was put in prison. Right. So the law worked. All so right. why, so are we why do we need more laws? Yeah, David Parnham, who called himself the Muslim Slayer, was jailed for 12 and a half years. Bear in mind he didn't slay any Muslims, so not very effective at your terrible job, are you? He sent packages containing fake anthrax, and he, served to sen uh, he is to serve his sentence in hospital until he's well enough to be transferred from prison. The old Bailey heard the 36-year-old had launched waves of malicious letters targeting mosques, the Queen, and politicians including David Cameron and Theresa May. He admitted offences including soliciting murder, encouraging crime, bomb and noxious substance hoaxes, and sending letters with intent to cause distress. That last one was what she was saying he should be definitely prosecuted for, the yeah. most egregious one, according to her. But he was sent to prison for a litany of other offences, and he's quite clearly a madman. So this doesn't really fit the bill for the rest of the complaints, particularly the Boris Johnson one, which was quite tepid. The court heard no violence was linked to the campaign. Right. Okay. So it didn't amount to anything. Just one nutcase, and he's already in jail. So why do we need to terraform our entire legal system to accommodate your offence? Uh, let's go back to the article, shall we? So, she says, With reference to Boris Johnson's comments, his position as Foreign Secretary contributed to a score of 10 in the recklessness category. So this is where she's scoring his offence. So this is the power 
privilege calculation. Do I get to know how races. you got that 10 score? Absolutely not. Of course. There was, there was genuinely no reasoning behind this. It's just arbitrary numbers. A score of 10 was also applied in the impact category as the comments reportedly orchestrated a 375% oh. rise in Islamophobic attacks against Muslim women in the UK. Have you heard that statistic before? I have heard it many times before. I think I'm, I'm pretty sure I've debunked it, but I've forgotten how exactly. So, so I believe carry yourself on. and Callum covered this at some point, but I decided to look up because I couldn't find the segment on our website and... I only found, it's from Tell Mama, an organisation which exists to combat Islamophobia, and the sources are two blog posts. Two blog posts with, if you just scroll down, John, for our, our audio listeners, the blog post is a photo, and it just says, campaign group Tell Mama said it received 38 reports. So not 375% increase, that's a scary number. 38 reports of anti-Muslim incidents, right, so just maybe a rude comment or you felt offended because you read the article itself. In the week after the Nail PM compared veiled women to letterboxes and bank robbers. Go to the next one. So so included with the 375% was people just getting offended at the article in the first place. And telling the grievance group that they the had been... The sectarian interest group. Which exists only as long as a perception of Islamophobia being widespread is perpetuated. Bear in mind... With this second blog post as well, this is where the 375% number comes from. So we know that it's only 38 incidents, but it's a 375% increase on top of what the former statistics were. And they've just linked this to Boris Johnson's Telegraph column because for some reason everyone reads the Telegraph now, despite readership being down pretty much across the board for all newspapers. And bear in mind, this is a blog post with no transcripts or police reports. So we don't know any of the individual case studies. And this is from an activist interest group who only get money as long as they continue to scaremonger. Entirely untrustworthy source. Well, yeah, this is just the power of propaganda. It takes all, all it takes is a single sentence with some nonsense on it, and it keeps getting perpetuated year on year. So we're three years down, over three years down the line, mm. and people are still using that statistic as if it's at all credible. Yeah, and there's tons of articles, and like the Independent was publishing multiple articles on the statistic. They never linked back to anything. They never linked back to the source. And this is the only source I can find. And it's from the group that they say it came from, but they've got no reports on their website or anything about it. It's just 38 people called up to us and complained, hopefully to access our services, which we get paid to do anyway. And so we said it's 375% increase from the week prior. So 375 Karens decided to call us in and suddenly we have to destroy the entire legal system in Britain. Okay, back to the article again. Intensity and intention were scored at 7 and 8 respectively, resulting in a total index score of 35. As a legal case before a judge, the high index would place squarely at the heart of the prosecution process the human impact of Johnson's comments compelling an appropriate sentence. So Boris Johnson should go to prison because 38 people rang up a Muslim grievance organisation and whined. Right. So what is actually being proposed here? Let's go on to our report. So this is the Index of Islamophobia Proposing an Enforcement and Prosecution Framework Report, which you can download the PDF from, from equalityactreview.co.uk. This is the PDF here. The foreword, if we can scroll down, please, John, um, it's written by Naz Shah. Now, are you familiar with who Naz Shah might be? Yeah. Yeah, so we're just going to go to Naz Shah's career history, reported by the Metro. Bear in mind, this was uh, the MP who was... I believe Keir Starmer appointed her head of like community cohesion or something on the Labour front bench. She'd been temporarily suspended because not only did she make a lot of anti-Jewish posts, but she said grooming gang victims should shut their mouths for the sake of diversity. Now, an Owen Jones parody account tweeted that out. She liked and retweeted it. So it's okay. I thought her fingers slipped, bro. Oh, sure. Yeah, multiple times. It's okay for some Muslim woman to get vaguely upset at a Telegraph column that is defending her entitlement to wear a burqa in a public place but actual rape victims should be quiet so we can increase immigration so some victims are okay and not others we're just we're just establishing that here in the legal system great so glad we have a two-tiered justice system in the original home of the global gold standard of jurisprudence but all right so we can go back to the report pdf here there's a very objective metric on page seven this is her index that's the entire index which she is proposing <laughs> that's it. yeah <laughs> That's how she is proposing we should sentence people for Islamophobia. So I give you a word and then you just uh, I pull one out your ass. I'll give intensity, I don't know, six. Yeah, it's uh, like top trumps has a more objective scoring metric than this word document table. And for all audio listeners, again, it's a three tier table with four different, five different, sorry, boxes. And it just says intensity score, intention score, impact score, recklessness score, total score. 
no way of even pretending there is an objective metric system to grade offense here. It's just saying, I'm going to rank you, considering how upset I am, and how demonic I think your intention was, and boom, years in prison. It seems legit to me. Yeah, I'm really glad we're creating a new state religion and an unimpeachable religious class to govern over us. So I'm, I'm just interested where the statements like Islam is right about women or Islam is questionable will rank in that. Because obviously there was a Scottish man who was arrested and charged for saying Islam is questionable, putting it on his own property. Where does that rank in that? Is, is, is that particularly intense? Is his intent to, to cause harm? None of this makes any sense. But it's not meant to. It's meant to be a naked power grab to make sure that their characteristic, which isn't even immutable, by the way, it's ideological, it's religious, it's self-associative, is beyond reproach. You cannot criticise Islam if you're in the UK. And that's why I titled this segment Criminalising the Kafar, because it actually outlaws non-belief. That is, if you drill down to it, if I were to say, as a Catholic, I think Islam is wrong, okay, the, the impact of that, I suppose our audience has wide reach. It's reckless because it offends Muslims. It's saying that the Prophet Muhammad will not turn, come down on Judgment Day with a winged horse with a human face. How could you criticise the obvious truth of Islam there? And I really look forward to serving time in prison for having a different conviction. Thanks very much. So what exactly is going to be policed? Go to page 11. Jokes. Right. Online comments posted on social networking sites such as Facebook and Twitter, blogging sites, chat rooms, and other virtual platforms are often spaces in which Islamophobic language is rife. Such comments can also appear in the form of racist jokes and stereotypical banter. That's actually in this report. So, banter is to be criminalised. Thank you very much. Again, complaints about not integrating to British sensibilities. If you're trying to criminalise banter, well... Mm, it's kind of what our national continuity thrives upon, which an, add an additional layer of assumed protection for perpetrators. So you're just, if you're trying to make a joke, you're just veiling your obvious prejudice. I was actually told that once by a university diversity and inclusion officer as to where some of my friends had made edgy jokes and she said, yeah, but the Nazi party disguised it as jokes to recruit people. No, they, what? No, they didn't. Because to appropriate a joke, I think it was from Nick, where it's pretty famous that the Beer Hall Putsch was just a comedy night that got out of hand. Yeah. Academics have argued, in such incidents are left unregulated and unsanctioned, they can escalate into physical attacks. Over the last decade, a significant proportion of reports made to Tell Mama comprised of an online incident of Islamophobia. Specifically, 69% were linked to the far-right groups English Defence League and British National Party, tracing the profiles of perpetrators, found that perpetrators of online abuse were mainly males who cited in their online abuse threats of offline abuse. Such threats were included burning down mosques to killing Muslim babies. Online commenters of hate were mainly anti-Pakistani, comprising of comments such as rape and paedophilia, incest, interbreeding, being terrorists, and killing Jews. So they've just been watching Callum's segments. We cannot possibly comment on that, and I guess we just sort of have to move on. And then on page 21, the report also mentions... Her last example in the article, an epidemic of hijab pulling hate crimes. Do you see a citation there? Uh, no. There's no footnote. No, in fact, I don't. I don't remember that article that we were starting the segment off with having a link on that either. No, it didn't. Isn't that amazing? Mm. But I did find one instance of it a little while ago. Mm -hmm. It was in New York, so it wasn't in the UK. So that's very far away. Yeah, and um, if we go to it, oh, she made it up. Right. Uh, so, so she asserts there's an epidemic of head headscarf pulling, but can't find a single example. And the one most prominent example in recent years, and this was six years ago now, so still quite a way away, was made up. An 18-year-old Muslim woman who claimed that three men attacked her on a Manhattan subway this month and tried to pull off her job was charged on Wednesday with filling a false report. Filing a false report, the police said. The woman, Yasmin Saweed, a student at Bangrook College, was also charged with obstructing governmental administration, the police said. Both charges are misdemeanors. So she got off with a slap on the wrist. Miss Saweed of New Hyde Park on Long Island had told the police that three white men screaming Donald Trump, the Jussie Smollett, Situation again, it seems, attacked her on December 1st at an uptown number six train at East 23rd Street, dnainfo.com reported. And this is from the New York Times, so a bit of a strange source to cite, but there you go. She told the police that the men had called her a terrorist, and then when she tried to remove to the other end of the subway car, one of them followed and tried to pull off her traditional headscarf. So she gets away with a fairly light punishment, but she got an outpouring of sympathy on social media. Um, there's obvious interest groups who exist to perpetuate 
a, a an environment of Islamophobia to solicit donations. So there's a system of perverse incentives here. And this overhauling of the justice system is just going to instantiate a class beyond criticism based on a bunch of faulty premises. So then the report ends with this. We recognize the significant improvements must be made in the law to enable the prosecution of Islamic phobic incidents. We propose a specific offense of Islamophobia to be instilled as part of the legal landscape, based on what definition? The Law Commission to take a more specific and detailed review of the Public Disorder Act, 1986, and the Crime and Disorder Act, 1998, in relation to Islamophobia. The Crown Prosecution Service must, as a matter of urgency, define religion and hostility in order to ensure the incidents of Islamophobia are brought to justice. Civil offences under the Equality Act 2010 must also be defined in a way that enables Islamophobic incidents and actions to be brought to justice. So I'm glad they're enforcing this across the board. Oh no, wait. Go to the last one, please. Crown Prosecution Service. Direct quote. There are references in the Bible which are simply no longer appropriate in modern society and which would be deemed offensive as stated in public. I suppose we'll have to apply that standard evenly over to the Quran as well, then. Well, we're not going to. So I look forward to the incoming Labour government criticising my religion and critiques of another. Mashallah, my brothers. Thanks for watching that segment from the podcast Lotus Eaters. If you enjoyed that, you can find more on our website, lotuseaters.com, where you can also sign up for £5 a month and get access to all of our premium content, including this recent contemplations that Josh and I did about how science proves that leftists are in fact bad people. If you'd like to find more from Josh, you can follow him over at Getter at Josh underscore firm. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you again soon.